The following is a presentation of the Six Arrows Radio Network. Episode 74, Ham Radio 360 Podcast. This time we got Eric coming on with us. Yeah, you've heard him before. 4Z1 Uniform Golf. Going to be talking ham radios from Israel. All star nodes and more coming up. MTCRadio.com presents Ham Radio 360, the podcast. Brought to you by Elecraft. Now, here's your host, Kel Nelson, K4CDN. Yeah, welcome into another episode of Ham Radio 360 podcast. Really excited for you to be here. It is number 74, which means the next one is number 75. And let me say that number 100 may be really super special, but I can't let any more out than that. And we've got plenty of time to get there in September. Uh, my name is Kale. I'm the host here, executive producer of Ham Radio 360 and all things 360 podcast. Really excited to have you here. I mean, we say it every time, all the time, a couple of times, but it's the truth. I mean, there would be no reason in for me sitting here in my barn doing this if it weren't for you listening on the other end. So thank you for giving us your time. Really excited about this program as we always are. This time through, it's a little different. Uh, we're, we're bringing on another podcaster, another amateur radio podcaster, Eric Guth, whose call is 4Z1 Uniform Golf. We're going to catch up with Eric in a few minutes. He is the host and producer of the QSO Today show. We're also going to talk about some all-star stuff and some things I didn't even know about the Holy Land. Uh, in, in the next coming segment, so don't go anywhere, right? I uh, want to remind you that if you're looking for some really cool amateur radio gear, you must shop with our friends down at Main Trading Company, mtcradio.com. They've been our sponsors from day one. I approach them. I ask them, will you sponsor this program? Uh, the reason I did that was because I had such tremendous experiences with them when I did purchases through them and have to this day always been very pleased with the business that I've done and shared with Main Trading Company. If you're looking for some ICOM gear, they have the entire line from the very top to the very bottom and everything in between. Buy your ICOM gear from my friends at Main Trading Company, found online at mtcradio.com. And don't forget, our brand new show sponsor, Elecraft. Yeah, the KX2 for Kel is happening really, really soon. Looks like it may show up this Wednesday. So that's tomorrow. They're sending me a demo rig, a KX2. I'm really stoked about it, man. I mean, I, I'm I'm like a little kid. It's almost Christmas, and Kel's finally going to get his hands on some Elecraft gear. If you're looking for something to use for Adventure Radio, springtime's coming. It's here. I can't even say it's coming anymore because it happened yesterday. So springtime is here. That means Adventure Radio is warming up for you. Get yourself a KX2, a KX3. Maybe you need a beautiful rig to put there in the shack. Check out the K3S. You can find it online from our show sponsors, Elecraft.com. I want to welcome into this episode of Ham Radio 360 a friend of mine online. This is the first time we've ever spoken physically, I guess you would say. Eric Guth, his call is 4Z1 Uniform Golf. That may sound familiar to you, and if it does, it's more than likely because you're a listener to the QSO Today podcast. Eric Hales from Israel, and uh, actually is in a suburb outside of Jerusalem. Thank you so much, Eric, for coming by the show and hanging out with us here. Yeah, thanks, Gail, for having me. As I said, you know, uh, before we started the recording, um, it's, I feel like I'm having a conversation with an old friend. We've been listening to each other's podcasts now for the last couple of years yeah and and i don't know who started first but i know that we were really close to kicking off about the same time and uh i'm approaching three years here so i guess you are too right yeah almost july uh, 2014 is when i started yeah yeah so we were in like probably 30 days of each other how odd was that hey let me ask you real quick before i start talking about your ham hobby um what possessed you to create an amateur radio podcast Oh, that's a good question. Um, I've been a ham radio operator since uh, 1972. I got my I got my novice license while I was a sophomore in high school in San Diego County in Southern California, and um, I had great mentors. Uh, I can say that um, uh, ham radio mentors kind of made the difference for me as a high school kid. Um, I had people to look up to and learn from. Um, I had a wonderful father. I still have a wonderful father who, um, you know, was he was very hands-on but not into electronics. Mm -hmm. So uh, the ham radio mentors were uh, terrific. So 
Um, when I turned 56 a few years ago, um, I made a bucket list, and one of the things I wanted to do was to create some way of recognizing Elmer's uh, ham radio mentors. And I thought the way to do that was to go back and um, interview as many of them as I could and tell their stories just so that perhaps it would inspire um, people to, um, to join the amateur radio ranks. But interestingly enough, I did a recent uh, listener survey, and the majority of my listeners are over 50 years of age who've been hams for over 30 years. <laughs> and they just, like, uh, they just like hearing the, you know, the stories of, um, you know, or similar stories to the ones that they had when they started an amateur radio. So uh, I guess that's kind of where the podcast has evolved to. But um, that's kind of how I got, it, got the start. I wanted to pay back. And, nice. um, and I've had a great great run so far 100 and almost 140 episodes i mean that that's a lot of work man i mean we know we know that these aren't uh these aren't things you just kind of hammer out in 30 minutes this is a lot of coordination and logistics and and then just the post-production and whatnot and, and you said off off uh off the show here that you do a lot of editing in your show just to really focus on your uh, your participant with you there in the interview so I can't even imagine uh, how much work you've been doing to get those done in this amount of time. It's uh, I would say it's a maybe close to 140 days worth of work. Wow! You know, it's about a day an episode. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay, that that makes sense to me, and uh, I, I like the idea where you've kind of kind of niched down even further. I guess they would say in the industry where you've you've dug in and you've found your. Uh, maybe not your target audience from the beginning, but your audience, what they've become now. That's a pretty interesting observation that basically you're talking to yourself. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a funny thing on the last episode that's up right, right now. I, um, you know, I, I try to appeal as we all do, um, for some listener support. And, um, so one of the things I, so I said this week was is that um, hey you know you're I know from the listener survey that you're you're over fifty you're you're male um, hey me too I am too <laughs> and um, and you know what we have to keep from getting fat in our old age and we have to walk so instead of joining a health club you know send me send me what you'd send to the health club every month and walk <laughs> with me every day nice you know with me and your earbuds and um, and uh, I think. You know, I'm I'm appealing to my audience, but I also know my audience, and my audience, um, you know, we we can be very sedentary, you know, in amateur radio, mm -hmm. and I think that um, part of um, the fact is is we're all going to live to be into our 90s. It looks like, you know, at this point, mm -hmm. and so we might as well do that in good health, and that's you know part of my appeal. So uh, anybody that knows me here knows that I'm an evangelist for walking, and um, I walk a couple miles a day with my dogs, and. Uh, and I'm kind of maybe advocating that hams should also walk a couple miles a day uh, uh, with their dogs or maybe without their dogs. But they should at least walk with the QSO Today podcast in their ear. And I also suggested they should listen to all the other ham radio podcasts at the same time while they're walking. Oh, man, we'll have them walking for days on end. That's right. They need to. They I, need to. Yeah, I like that idea. I, just, I could, could stand some exercise myself. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that encouragement, Eric. So we'll uh, we'll put that on the list as well. That's pretty cool, though. You decided you wanted to do something to give back. And, and I think that's what a lot of people, when they decide to begin podcasting, at least that's what I've gathered from my time in it, is it, uh, it's something you're into. It's something that's kind of changed your life more than likely. And it changed you to the extent that you wanted to share that change with other people. Well, as you know, it's um, you know, podcasting isn't free. It costs a, a few hundred dollars a month if you're hosting on servers and stuff like that. So it's nice to have the you know the expenses covered, but it's not a at least not not at this point. It's not a career. Yeah. And um, and it's a it's a labor of love. I I, I have learned so much. I think in the last uh, almost uh, three years, uh, interviewing um, these amazing Elmers, and um, I just can't. You know, I just can't tell you. I, you, you I, I can tell you because, you, you know, you do it yourself and uh, and you see what uh, what real benefits you get from uh, learning at the at the knees of these people. Oh, man, I tell you, I don't know where I would be in amateur radio without the audience that, that we have, the, the guests that we've had and uh, other podcasters, other content creators making and putting out what they're making and putting out. Um, I'm sure there would be someone else in my place. I'm not saying that, but me personally, I would be 
either disconnected or really uninterested right now if I did not have these people pushing me along. And some of them taking me along with them. I'm taking others along with me. But we're all headed in the same direction, and that's just learning more about this humongous hobby. Well, I think there's never been a time in amateur radio when we've had um, just the remarkable resources that are available you know, from the Internet and the ability to share and the ability to create micro-communities around uh, various kinds of technology that's in ham radio. And uh, I think what we're seeing then as a result of that is just exponential growth in terms of you know, moving the stone forward or uh, advancing the state of the art, which was one of the intents of the uh, ham radio hobby. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, my, my kids have... My kids have kind of laid off their study, and I think they got bored with it. And um, I'm, I'm getting ready to begin that push again with them. And, and they're kind of, yeah, you know, and then their cousins are walking around with their cell phones all the time. And my kids are like, well, I can't have a cell phone, so I guess I'm going to have to get my license kind of a thing. So, you know, we we all have different reasons for getting into the hobby. I just always wanted to back as a kid. I didn't really know what it was, but I knew that it was more than CB radio was. And uh, CB filled a niche for a while but needed that further expansion and ham was there and and boy the day i found out i didn't have to have a a a morse code certificate anymore i was i was ready to go so it didn't take but a you know a few days and i was licensed i cheated sorry well i i remember as a kid um seeing these uh briefcase telephones mm-hmm. and um you know that it must have been on television and they you know they were and i didn't really know how they worked at the time but i You know, I had these ideas of, you know, going to summer camp and taking one of these briefcase telephones with me. So, uh, you know, becoming a ham radio operator as a teenager was um, was probably as close as I got to it. And uh, it was a time when uh, when uh, in in the Los Angeles area, everybody was building out um, repeaters and remote base stations and uh, and uh, auto patching. And there was no cellular telephone in those days. There was. there was commercial what was called IMTS or other kinds of um, VHF, UHF mobile telephones. But uh, I think the hams in Southern California and maybe across the rest of the country, although I don't know it, but the hams in Southern California probably were running some of the most advanced um, full duplex communication systems on the planet. And um, and frankly, it was it was fun to be part of that and to uh, at some point realize that maybe I was too old for summer camp, but I, I had the full duplex mobile <laughs> telephone in the car. Well, you know what I love is is when folks say, "Well, why ham radio?" And, and of course, you can say, "Oh, well, it works when nothing else does." But I always kind of go back to, "Well, what's that in your hand now?" Oh, this is my iPhone seven. I'm like, "Well, that's about ninety percent of that is ham radio." You're welcome. You know. That really, that right. really no, freaks I, people I think out. You're right. Yeah, they they don't really realize what this old man hobby, and I say that with quotations, uh, what it has generated and created for our our everyday conveniences we enjoy not even thinking about it. No, oh, I think that's uh, that's true. I think um, I, I found this, at least with the um, QSO Today podcast guests, that many of them were inspired by the uh, Sputnik launch you know, in the late oh, 50s. Yeah. And the and the space program and the space pro- program created an opportunity for lots of hams to become um, engineers and um, and really um, be a part of programs that were really moving the needle forward. So and I don't think there was anything. Well, maybe the maybe the the advent of uh, of computers, but I think that came out of the space program too. I don't think there was anything but the push to the moon mm-hmm. in the '60s that probably created more technologies and advanced the state of the art more than that. And um, I'm sure that you're, we'll, we'll have people that'll send me, send me an email or send you an email and say, oh, what's Eric talking about? But I, th- I think that that was, uh, that was key to it. And I think a lot of the technology that we use now, you know, is really derived from, um, from the space program and um, what it set in motion, you know, in the 70s and 80s. It's funny you say that. We had, we just recently made a trip down to uh, Orlando for PodFest, and we stopped by Kennedy Space Center on the way home, and they were showing the history of space travel and whatnot, and they talked about the, the launch of Sputnik, and it said every ham ra- – in their in their video, they said every, every ham radio operator in America was striving to hear the transmissions from Sputnik. And my, my five-year-old daughter pulled the shirt. Dad, Dad, she they just said ham radio. <laughs> <laughs> she heard it, and I was like, yeah, well, that's exactly what Eric just said here. So you're right. I, I believe that it did really give that push to where we are today. 
and it's kind of sad to see NASA take a break, but maybe now they're going to kind of come back to life, and that will be exciting as well. So we'll have to see. Well, I think um, I, I think obviously the um, you know the whole silicon industry came from that, but oh, yeah. uh, the the internet now, as I say in ham radio, the fact that we can um, collaborate so quickly on on whether it's uh, SDR radio or anything. Uh, look at Farhan's um, Bidex oh, yeah. <laughs> transceiver that he's he's selling for I don't know forty bucks from uh, from India. Yeah. Um, he he's collaborating with people all over, all over the world. It's almost open source, and as a result of that, he's um, he's pushing this product, you know, out of India and sending it all over the world for practically nothing. And um, and if you look at that technology and what he's done, and then what you can do with it, you know, what the community is doing with it. Um, it's just amazing uh, how uh, how the internet has really added um, to creating this um, huge spectrum of ham radio technology. When, when when I started, it was you know you were either on HF or you were on VHF UHF, and there wasn't a lot of stuff in the middle. Mm-hmm. Um, now there's you know, you're running a microwave link, I think, from your um, from your barn to your house, right? Well, so yep, yep. Right, and you could do that over amateur radio frequencies if you're not if you're not already doing that. But um, you know that's just a a tiny sliver of what's actually happening in ham radio now. Yeah, it's really it's really funny because uh, just been an outsider for so many years, having dabbled with radio and even worked at Radio Shack and and had this 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 gentleman. I really wish I knew this man's name because when I go back to think of how I got here, uh, there was a gentleman that would come into uh, Radio Shack, and and I was tenth grade guy you know finish this day at school and and stop at the house put the shirt and tie on and drive to drive to the shack and uh this guy i'll never forget the first time i ever met him he came in he was looking for aluminium wire now in south carolina we don't ever say the word aluminium i mean i had never heard that in my 17 years at that time he was saying aluminum but we say aluminum he says aluminium he wasn't from around here and um, as we got to talking, he wasn't he, from these parts. Yeah, he wasn't from around here. So, so we talked for a few minutes, and he was explaining to me that he was building some antennas uh, for his shortwave radio, and he was also an amateur radio operator. And he, that poor man, came in about once a week, and and I, I cannot remember. I mean, this was, gosh, this was thirty some odd years ago, uh, or twenty plus years ago, I guess. But anyway, I really r- wish I had known who that gentleman was. Wish I'd have spent more time getting to know him, outside of just him begging me to get my amateur license because he tried really hard. But now that I look back at it, I'm like, you know, that, that was my really, that was my first touch, my first taste of amateur radio. And, uh, that, that still excites me thinking about that today, thinking, wow, that guy was really trying his best to introduce me to this amazing technology. I was just a little too worried about women and big speakers at the time, just to be completely transparent. But, um, it, it was that was my first taste, and um, I'll never forget the aluminium because I just looked. I remember looking at him like this man does not speak in English. I mean, <laughs> and I've never heard that in Spanish class, so I don't know what word he's trying to say. And it was aluminum. Yeah, he just said it differently. So that was that was my first first ham connection there. But but well, now my- now you know now everything is just so big and so interconnected. Uh, you just get on the Z or any of the forums or Facebook or whatever, and you've got a thousand hams to choose from at one time in your hand. Oh, that's certainly true. Well, you know, since you've mentioned your first, uh, uh, the guy that inspired you perhaps towards ham radio, um, I, I want to take this opportunity to say that my first uh, mentor was a guy named Gary Parks, K6 UIM, K6 Uniform India Mike. And um, and my exposure to ham radio was as we lived in a condominium development in Whittier, California, and um, we were building my my father and my brothers and I were building a dune buggy in my father's garage, and this was very common in the '60s and '70s that people would work on projects or at least you know middle class people would work on pro- projects in their garages mm-hmm. uh, at night, and um, so this guy comes down the street and he says I need to borrow a socket wrench. And um, so if my dad had every tool, still does, every tool known to man for just about any project. And so he loaned him a socket set. And I said, so uh, what are you building? And he says, well, I'm uh, installing a Heathkit garage door opener. <laughs> well, I already had an interest in electronics and stuff. And frankly, um, you know, ripping apart a 66 VW to turn into a dune buggy didn't seem that interesting at the time. So I followed him home uh, at the end of the building, which is where he lived. And, uh, and sure enough, 
you know, there there was this garage door opener, so I helped him put it put it up. And then I noticed he's got this transceiver in his car. He's got the uh, Henry uh, Tempo One at the time. And um, I say, hey, what's that? And it's big loading coil on the back of this car. He says, oh, that's amateur radio. That's how it started for me wow. is this neighbor, you know, borrowing a socket set <laughs> and a socket wrench. And um, and there he was. So uh, unfortunately, uh, Gary passed away at a very early age. So um, he wasn't a mentor for very long. But, uh, you know, that was my first exposure and um, and it lasted forever. Nice. Yeah, here you are 40-plus years later still celebrating the fact that he was uh, there with a Heath kit garage door opener. Garage door opener, yeah, that's it. Well, I'll find one of those on eBay, I bet it'd cost you a nice Well, penny. nobody had a garage door opener in those days, oh. you know, so, you know, so old people. My, my grandparents had a garage door opener, but it was they were very rare. I mean, everybody right. seems to have one now, but um, at that time, I that ooh, that's really cool. <laughs> and um, But the ham radio was even cooler, and uh, that was... That was really, uh, well, you know, what set the fire for yeah, me. Yeah, that's cool. Guys, we're chatting with Eric Guth here. His call is 4Z1 Uniform Golf. You may recognize, again, that name and call from the QSO Today podcast. We've touched on that just real quickly here. Uh, we're going to come back with Eric in just a moment as we continue our conversation on Ham Radio 360 podcast. Hi, Dan, KB6NU here. Whether you're studying for your tech license or looking to upgrade to general or extra, you should check out my no-nonsense amateur radio license study guides. Written in my easy-to-understand, no-nonsense style, they really are the easiest way to learn what you need to know to pass the test. And they are always up to date. The PDF version of the Technician Class Study Guide is free on my website at kb6nu.com podcast. And all my study guides are available in print, PDF, Kindle, and EPUB versions. Let me help you have more fun with ham radio. Go to kb6nu.com slash podcast and get started today. All right, so we're back here with Eric Guth, 4Z1 Uniform Golf, and Eric is in a suburb of Jerusalem, which makes him right in the middle of the Holy Land there in Israel. Eric, um, I've had one QSO over radio. It was a DMR QSO with a gentleman in Israel, which was really cool. That was the first time I've ever made the connection there. I'm not going to count it because it's DMR. But uh, I'm really curious because it seems to me that that uh, hams operating there in Israel are really sought after on the bands. Uh, can you talk a little bit about being a ham in Israel and, and the aspects of it all right there? Yeah, well, sure, Kale. Um, ham radio in Jerusalem um, – I'm sorry. Ham radio in Israel is, um, is an old you know, art – uh, one of the uh, early uh, guests that I had on the QSO Today podcast uh, was uh, Amnon Bargiora, uh, who uh, 4X1DF Delta Fox, and um, he passed away, I think, in November at the ripe old age of, I think, 93. Hmm. And uh, he was one of the early pioneers in ham radio. Uh, just as the state was being formed, uh, the, ham, the ham radio service started shortly after that. And um, so it's an old service as far as the country is concerned. And, um, and because uh, the, the cost of long distance calls uh, to America and to Europe and stuff was very high up until relatively recently, um, ham radio had probably two, 3,000 hams in the country. And keep in mind, our, wow. our population now is about 8 million, but... Um, then it was probably only about a million, two million. So the number of hams uh, uh, was relatively high to the population, and uh, there was ham radio stations uh, in just about every little village uh, in Israel. Now I think um, there's probably um, maybe less than 2,000 hams in Israel um, the active members of the uh, Israel Amateur Radio Club, which is R A W R L, mm -hmm. um, I think is less than 500. Um, this is probably prompted by a number of things that have happened in the history of of ham radio in Israel. And by the way, the, the his, history of ham radio in, in Israel is actually pretty cool because uh, Motorola has had an R and D facility in Israel since 1962, 63. And a lot of the uh, engineers at Motorola were hams. 
So a lot of Motorola innovation that ends up in North America actually came from the Motorola R&D facility in Israel. Cool. And uh, so, yeah, that's, a, that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. So um, there's a long history. But what actually ended up happening was is, is the, as cellular towers started to proliferate across the country, and we've got amazing cellular coverage in this country. I think you can go, go into just about every square inch of the, of the country, and you've got some kind of um, 3G or 4G signal. Um, which allows you to do data and everything else um, on the one hand. On the other hand, uh, everybody who loves to use uh, cell phones doesn't want a cell phone tower <laughs> in, in their neighborhood or on their apartment building. So the hams got painted with the, um, with the brush of, um, of cellular telephone towers. And so a lot of the, unless you were grandfathered uh, onto your apartment building, if you moved to a new apartment building, then you had to deal with the uh, homeowners association of the building. And, um, and most likely you couldn't put anything up. Mm -hmm. So a lot of hams, uh, as they got older and they moved around, their, their amateur radio activity didn't go with them. Right. <clears throat> Recently, the, um, the Israel Amateur Radio Club, within the last few years, uh, worked really hard to and at some expense to separate the hams from the cellular telephone providers the israel amateur radio club decided to fight that and change the law and as a result of that they were able to um to get the law changed or amended uh, a few years ago and that meant that we could put up um, wire antennas on top of apartment buildings and um and these wire antennas could be on a mass that's Nine meters is it nine meters? I think it's nine meters tall, uh, so not quite thirty feet. Yeah, uh, and and a, a hex beam is is also included as a wire antenna. Nice. Now, so the the law allows us to do this on the one hand. On the other hand, um, this law hasn't re really been tested yet, which means that um, somebody's got to put up a hex beam on top of their apartment building, and um, and they've got to go to court. <laughs> So that this precedent can be set and mm -hmm. set into law so that um, the hams are protected. So I guess um, we just need to find somebody with um, the time and the money. And probably, you know, the ham, ham operators in this country would help support this, um, you know, their defense. Yeah. But um, this needs to be tested. And so there's a lot of people who aren't yet willing to test it. But, you know, we're an older ham radio population. And... Um, and uh, we still have some bureaucracy in the communications ministry, and there are some, you know, issues that run there. So, you know, getting getting the kids in and getting their licenses quickly and getting them on the air and all the stuff, these seem to be our challenges. And um, I'm hoping that uh, that this will all turn around before there aren't many of us left. Unfortunately, it seems like Every other week, I get a, a notice from the Israel Amateur Radio Club that another ham has passed on. So, um, you know, we're working against a, a dwindling population. We're not growing at the rate that American hams are growing. Tell me about the testing, if you will, in Israel and how that works regarding uh, the different classes of licenses that you guys have. Well, I think we have three or four classes of licenses, very similar to North America. Um, they're, they're now code-free for the most part, um, I I got my um, I have a, a class one uh, license or class A license, which is um, similar to the extra class in America, and I got that because I have the extra extra class in America. So there's uh, they they honored the when I moved here they honored my extra class license, and uh, and gave me their um, class A license. Now the the issue really is 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 that um, these tests are not like America, so they're not uh, there's no testing pool. There's no question pool that you can uh, look at. And uh, so it's kind of still done in kind of the old-fashioned way. You don't have to draw schematics, I don't think. Um, but I've never taken these courses. Okay. But I'm, 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 I've I'm I'm been told that they're um, relatively difficult. The other thing is is, is that um, that may be different, which is kind of interesting, is, is we have a, a version of the license that's very similar to the American Technician Class license. And one of the ways to move it to a general class license here or a class B license is, I think, to do 50 QSOs with an Elmer uh, on the air. And uh, that's actually very interesting because it, it gives uh, a, a person who's just gotten their – maybe their uh, 
technician class, or they're, I think that this is a Class D license, um, it gives them the opportunity to actually be on the air and see how things work and actually how to operate the radio and how to conduct oneself on the air. And they have to do that 50 times, and then that gets them, you know, uh, through the uh, requirement for the general class without the code requirement. So I, like uh, I think that's kind of cool. That is really cool because, I mean, how many times do you get on Facebook or any internet forums or Twitter or whatever, and you have a guy who just got his, you know, just went in set for a class, and you know he doesn't know how to where to put his antenna tuner or, you know, what antenna to put up for forty meters or something, and you know, with just a little bit of help and somebody local, man, that could really make a big difference. But uh, what not a great way for a, like a local club or an Elmer or something to introduce the, a younger person into the hobby by being there with them and helping them progress that way. I like that a lot. Well, I think it's so important. I think it's um, uh, the ham radio clubs were um, very important, you know, for my ham radio development. And uh, I think that Having an Elmer, you know, take you by the hand and show you how to, well, nowadays you don't have to worry about the high voltage necessarily, right. so you don't have to worry about, you know, killing yourself. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's very important to uh, to have someone that you know that knows the ropes that can keep you safe. I, there's, I, I got my recent uh, QST that has the the young lady climbing the tower, and um, and I was thinking about that. I thought I would, might write a blog post about that as as a young man. Um, young man, as a teenager, climbing towers uh, on two-way radio sites because I had a repeater. I was working on a repeater and uh, not looking at the harness, really, you know, putting it on, but not, you know, checking to see if it wasn't torn, if it, you know, if I had, <clears throat> because I was young and invincible. Yeah, 10 feet and, tall bulletproof um, kind of a thing. That's exactly right. So having somebody that um, that's seasoned and knows the ropes uh, I think makes a huge difference, an order of magnitude difference in the ham radio experience and and where it can go from there. Yeah, so one of the reasons uh, that I started the show initially way back as full time uh, was to learn along with the guys who may be listening to the program, who may have something to offer to me or someone else like me trying to learn about the hobby. And maybe uh, maybe there's some other guys out there that are wanting to come along this journey, and they may be interested in something that we can learn about together that we might not have known or ever had that opportunity to address had it not be for that type of communications with a podcast. So uh, like you do with interviewing Elmers on the QSO Today show, uh, you know, we've just tried to learn here as well. And I think it's been it's been quite uh, helpful, I know, to me. Well, I hope so, <laughs> uh, on the one hand. On the other hand, I think, you know, our, our podcasts and the Facebook groups and all this stuff, um, I think they're like, um, you know, a um, – it's a thin veneer. It's a patina, as it as it were, on the ham radio process. And so, therefore, I can't stress how important it is to actually have a live ham mentor, you know, in your vicinity, to because you actually need to see things and you actually need to, um, you know, experience things with somebody else in person in order to you know, really move your needle ahead, but also to keep you safe. Again, it's um, you know, there's so much to this that I guess if you're working on Arduinos and uh, and you're building in your in your shop, but even if you're not building in your if you're you're building in your shop, but maybe you're new to tools and stuff, having somebody close by makes a huge huge difference. It does, it does, and if nothing else, uh, camaraderie is one of the greatest things that we could do. My my, my wife purchased me a uh, Kenwood TS850 for my 40th birthday a few years back. Oh, and, good for her. Yeah, and I was oh, it's a cherry rig, man. It is like two owners. It's just beautiful. But uh, I was mm -hmm. having some trouble with it. it. Not trouble with the rig. It was just my understanding because I went from a TS-50, which is, you know, bare bones as it could be to this radio with filters and stuff. So found out that a local local guy here, K4XP, has a tremendously awesome station. And he, he has one of these backup spare rigs in the back room. And he offered to come on over, bring a piece of paper and a pencil, and we'll go over this thing. And I made a bunch of notes. And, man, it was cool to get to hang out, get to spend time with Keith, but at the same time get to learn about the rig that I had been wanting for so long. And, and now it makes sense to operate now. And I couldn't have gotten that on a YouTube video, and I couldn't have gotten that through a podcast. It took someone sitting there with me to uh, to help me understand what I was missing. 
No, I saw your picture of your um, repeater hanging on the wall in your uh, in your barn there, yeah. and the APRS stuff, and um, and certainly you've had help with that, and um, and it makes a huge difference, right, in terms of how it's all turning out. Oh man, I will tell you, if if it weren't for people helping, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't exist. It's what it amounts to, really. And um, I think that's one of the things that we kind of lose sight of in the hobby is, oh well, you know, I've got a handy talkie, I can get in the local repeaters, I'm done, I don't need any help. But there's so much more to it. Uh, I mean, it's taken me three years to get APRS, and it hadn't been for Kenneth Finnegan, I would still be scratching my head. So uh, we're, we're progressing, and we're getting, we're moving forward, which is really exciting. Uh, but it has taken help, and I am very grateful for every bit of that that I can receive. To, I know, to wrap up on yeah, Israel, by yes. the way, I'm just going to say that. Um, um, but there are some things happening here. Uh, you talked to somebody on DMR, uh, yep. a, a new resident um, brought with him uh, a DMR repeater. And that repeater is, um, you know, with some with some help from the Israel Amateur Radio Club and convincing the communications ministry that we could operate DMR here. Um, that DMR repeater is operating in Tel Aviv, but there's other DMR repeaters going up uh, as well. So um, and and people are, you know, getting involved in that. So I'm sure that you'll start hearing a lot more DMR activity from Israel. And then also uh, we, we're going to talk a little bit about All Star um, as a result of. Um, uh, my my putting the first all star node in in Israel. Um, there's a group finally that um, has decided that they want to do all star as well. So we're starting to build all star uh, repeaters across Israel as well. So um, hopefully more of us will be out there on uh, DMR and all star. I know that uh, Israel is not a really large country, and um, there, there's always a lot going on there. But every time I hear someone or see someone talking about seeing a spot or something from someone in Israel, everybody's really excited about it to get Israel on HF. Uh, is it because of the, the lack of infrastructure or the ability to, to put up your own antennas and you don't have towers stuck up everywhere and uh, maybe you, you guys aren't getting out doing uh, portable ops? I mean, what really, what really makes it hard to get a contact in Israel? Um, I think the lack of numbers. I mean, there's... Okay. Um, the lack of of on the air operators is probably the uh, the hardest thing. Again, it's from the antenna law. It's from um, older hams migrating to new apartments where they couldn't have antennas. Uh, it's my understanding um, uh, that that there'll be some remote stations in Israel at some point. Uh, electronic noise here is uh, is probably as miserable as it is in North America from um, from uh, LED dimmers. Uh, to uh, to switching power supplies, so um, uh, there's all these factors I think that keep uh, a lot of Israeli hams off the low bands, mm -hmm. and uh, it's too bad. I mean, uh, hopefully th that'll change. Uh, a friend of mine and I are trying to find a place right now to put a remote station, so that and it doesn't have to be far away. It just has to be you know kind of out of the neighborhood, right. so that we can actually you know work uh, HF uh, without having to listen to all the noise. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're going to continue to learn more about Israel and amateur radio and the QSO Today podcast. We're chatting with Eric Guth. His call is 4Z1 Uniform Golf, and you're listening to Ham Radio 360 podcast. Main Trading Company is your place to shop for Kenwood radios. It's where I buy mine, whether it's the TM281 single band two meter radio, which is just awesome. Maybe you're looking for a tremendously powerful yet easy to use mobile radio, dual band, cross band repeat. Look no further than the Kenwood TMV71A. I talk about these radios all the time. Why? Because they serve me so well. If you're needing a dual band radio, maybe a single band radio, check out the Kenwood offerings from mtcradio.com. All right, so we're back with Eric. And Eric, you have uh, so many times encouraged me to put up an all-star node and uh, the, with this new repeater, the k 4 CDN repeater uh, that we're working on, and, and it's up and running on UHF here in South Carolina. I, I'm just really curious. Uh, all I've ever heard about necessarily was IRLP or Echolink. And you mentioned all-star, and I know it's got to be similar somehow, but I don't know if it's just a Kel don't know about it. Kel's never heard about it. What is All Star, and why would I want to install that with my repeater? No, that's a good question, Kale. <laughs> Um, You know, as an All Star advocate, I actually I discovered All Star um, probably five six years ago when I went to the states, 
and uh, I was talking on uh, UHF in um, on a repeater in uh, Los Angeles, and somebody mentioned All Star. I said, "Oh, what is All Star?" And so, uh, so what All Star is is All Star is a an open source uh, repeater linking protocol based on the asterisk phone system. So, if 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 you look up um, uh, asterisk or asterisk dot org. This is a this is a telephone system or telephone exchange a PBX that was um, that was made open source by a guy named Mark Spencer. He went on to um, create a company uh, around uh, Asterisk that sells uh, commercial phone systems and stuff. So anyway, there was a guy. Uh, unfortunately, um, Jim Dixon WB6NIL became a silent key uh, in December, but um, Jim was. Uh, was a pioneer in the Asterix phone system hardware, and uh, he worked with Mark Spencer to create um, some of the first boards that were used to interface the um, telephone exchange to the Asterix phone system. And as a result of that, uh, Jim being a longtime ham, and I, I'm not paying Jim as much credit as he deserves, so anybody listening to this that has more information, um, I hope they'll contact me because I want to do a segment someday on, uh, on Jim. But um, uh, Jim decided that um, he could make a, a, a radio control layer that went on top of the Asterisk phone system. So essentially what All-Star is, is All-Star is, is this, this phone system. Now, now it's riding on a Raspberry Pi 3 that has uh, this bit of software that allows you to control a radio. That means you can li listen to the uh, FM receiver's discriminator. Um, you can, you know, through an... Uh, a, a um, audio interface, you can um, detect the uh, CTCSS or the private line or whatever we're calling it today. Mm -hmm. um, you can um, process the audio. You can you can have squelch. All of this is done in this layer, and um, and then you can also generate CTCSS out into the transmit side. So everything rides in you know essentially at this point two pieces in a in the uh, URI, which is the audio interface. Um, that's connected by USB to the Raspberry Pi, and then all of the functions that um, that you would like to have in a repeater control system are available as software. So um, Jim created a, a, a very extensive control set that allows you to um, to do all the things that you would normally have done in hardware or, or with a you know with a microprocessor uh, in the traditional. Um, repeater control systems, mm -hmm. but but what's even more important than that, um, All Star essentially is designed for linking, and it links as if it was um, linking two phone systems together. So these links are very high, you know, quality, um, and this is done, you know, with. Uh, telephone codecs. So any uh, people are going to have to look in your show notes to see what you know <laughs> codecs are if they don't know. But but essentially, um, it allows us to link these together full duplex, so that um, I can talk and listen at the same time if I'm duplex on the radio that I'm talking on, and uh, and that the person at the other end can as well. So oftentimes we'll, you'll hear this is 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 that every um, in the states, you know, after midnight every night, except at 11 p.m. Uh, California time, there's the wind system has the um, insomniac net. Oftentimes, the control operators there are operating All Star and their full duplex, so that somebody can come in and interrupt them, and they'll hear it. So this is unique to All Star in that it's full duplex, and it's different from IRLP, which is which is not full duplex; it's half duplex, meaning that if I'm talking. Um, I can't be interrupted. But the other thing is, is, is if, if someone else is talking, I don't have control of, over the system until they stop talking. Mm. So, um, so I have uh, I have a uh, UHF repeater, you know, in my shack here. Uh, it's a, I only running about five watts, so it covers my neighborhood. I can do, as I said earlier in an earlier segment, that I do a lot of walking, so I can walk around a frat where I live, and uh, and talk to my repeater. Uh, there's another user here, uh, also in town, that uses it, and um, and I link full duplex to um, um, usually to the wind system in uh, Southern California, but I can link to probably now over a thousand uh, All Star users around the world, and it's all done, you know, with DTMF, 
So uh, it's easy to control. Uh, we can write scripts. So I've got some scripts in here that um, if I um, go to a, a busy system like the uh, like the wind system, I don't want to listen to all the telemetry coming back. So Allison, the uh, the voice of, of uh, Asterisk, is also the voice of All Star. And uh, if the telemetry is turned on every time somebody connects or disconnects from a very large network, then I hear that um, Allison... Um, announcing the connection or the disconnection. So what I do is I can create a script that when I connect to something that I use a lot, I, I can turn off the the, uh, the telemetry and I can set the carry delay for a, a certain period of time and I can you know do all kinds of things. And I can do that uh, as a macro. So I, I put in a code and, and it, it, it sets off the script and the script goes through and does all of the maintenance things it needs to do and then I'm all, all set up. So when I encourage you to use All Star, Kale, it's because one, it's open source, and that means that um, even with um, Jim Dixon's uh, early passing, uh, he was a young man. Uh, um, there are still uh, people um, working in AllStarLink.org who are who are carrying the ball forward, um, advancing the state of the art, um, making it uh, or, or provisioning the software so that it works on. On it used to work on PCs. Now it works on the Raspberry Pi three. So um, it, the ball is moving forward, and uh, it's it's not proprietary. So you're not paying for licenses or hardware or anything like that, um, other than what you need to, to make it work. Mm -hmm. And um, and you don't even have to use that hardware. I think I, last night I I, I built another uh, audio interface using a uh, two dollar and fifty cent um, audio card that I got from uh, from eBay. Wow. So I'm anxious to see whether it actually works, but uh, and whether I can still see, you know, uh, soldering these little boards um, uh, at this point um, is is quite a challenge, especially since I can't really see the work anymore. <laughs> but um, the hazards of old age. Well, let me but, ask you this: uh, You're talking yeah. about it's it's a repeater controller, but can you also just use it like a standalone D star node that someone puts up in their house to do uh D star over TCP IP or anything like that? Okay. So it's, it, it doesn't, it's, it's, it's primarily analog. Okay. Right. So it's, so it, it doesn't, it doesn't do D star and it doesn't do DMR. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, uh, there's other uh, products and protocols for that. Yeah. The reason I suggested it for you was, is because you're running an analog repeater. Right. And, um, and it would give you a way to link out of the neighborhood, because I understand you're in a rural neighborhood. I'm in a rural neighborhood, by the way. That's the reason I do All Star is, is because uh, the hams I know and still know, uh, or knew and still know, um, are in California. Mm -hmm. So um, the reason I jumped on it uh, very early on was, is because it gave me the ability to, um, you know, to talk to my friends uh, from here to there. Right. So uh, it, it's great for. Um, for being out in the sticks and um, and you know connecting to uh, a larger hubs. So now you, what you, we're doing here, you need an oh, internet. Sorry. You need an internet connection to do that. But past that, it's just a Raspberry Pi, for instance, and you're good to go. It's a Raspberry Pi and what's and an audio interface card. We call it a URI. They, the, those audio interface cards are available from several sources, mm -hmm. and um, and that's it. And a radio. Yeah. So what I use is I use. Um, I found on eBay a bunch of uh, Tate UHF mobile radios. Uh, our, our band here is 430 to, 4, to 440, essentially. So I needed something that you know would tune into that range. So uh, the Tate radios are, are were ideal for that, although uh, many of the Motorola radios now, um, uh, Kenwood radios will do that, commercial radios. So yeah. you take the commercial radios and you, you bring them into the range. Um, I'm using two of those. I've got a bunch here, a bunch of those radios that I bought so I'm 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 using them to to create other All Star nodes in Israel, and um, and they work great. And I just turned the power down so that I don't have a an issue with burning up you know the finals because uh, if you get on a big system, um, I can I can get on the wind system and uh, my transmitter will be up for three four hours wow. continuously. Wow! So uh, that's a whole lot and, of talking. And I'm keeping the, and I'm keeping the channel busy, which is the other the, the other thing is we're building UHF All Star nodes. Uh, across Israel, because um, I'm convinced, and I think I've convinced others that um, if we don't use these channels, um, we'll lose these channels, right. and um, you know, to taxi cabs or uh, because uh, 
there's a there's a thing in Israel, you know, it's easier to apologize than ask permission. So uh, until somebody jumps on the taxi cab guys that are using uh, amateur radio frequencies for taxi cabs or anything that they find and discover that they can use, until that happens, then um, the chances will lose those frequencies. So um, I, I'm really made a push here to start using these UHF channels that we have and um, and putting all star nodes on it. And then if those all star nodes are talking all day long because they're listening to traffic from North America, then um, um, one, it's interesting to listen to, and two, it's legal, and three, it keeps the channel busy. Now, if if you're a guy who who's listening to this and are like, hmm, I haven't heard of this before. I think I would like to do this. Uh, you don't have to be a repeater owner. I mean, you can, like you said, you. I guess you're building your own repeater. Uh, do you have to have a to have a repeater to utilize this, or can you use it just as a standalone connection to the internet uh, there in your shack? No, that's a good question. Um, obviously, in North America, the the number of repeaters, especially if you get into a, an urban area, is much larger. I mean, all the all of the coordinated channels could be gone, and probably uh, many of the channels are being reused by multiple groups. Um, in, in a rural area, or a guy that wants just to have, you know, a we call it a node, an yeah. all star node. Um, all star will also work on a simplex radio. So my first all star node was on a on a, a little VHF radio operating one watt, and um, and uh, as as long as it was transmitting, I couldn't interrupt it. But the protocol when you're talking on these linked radios now is 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 that you you talk, you release, you you, you count to three and let somebody else you know come in. So there's there's a little break in between the re- replies, and so therefore you have the ability to control the radio. Mm-hmm. The, but the other thing is, is, is that even if you don't have that control, you do have the ability now to um, control it with a web browser. So um, I can, I, if I need to, I can use my smartphone to to control the system over the internet, and uh, you know, and shut it down or change its its uh, links or or whatever I need to do. Is is this all star thing? Is it just a West Coast, U.S. West Coast, and outside of the U.S. thing, or is this something that you see people all over the uh, all over the continents using, um, just like they do DMR, D star, uh, wires, fusion, all those other ones? No, I think um, I mean it, it largely started in the United States, but I, I see that it's it's spreading out. There's um, um, users in uh, Australia, uh, New Zealand. Um, I've I've spoken to them. Um, South Africa. There's an All Star node. Um, I, th- I think that as it gains popularity, the, the the what's driving the pop- popularity, I think, is the fact that the Raspberry Pi three is you know thirty five dollars, right. and um, it doesn't take any power, and it makes a really cute little All Star node. And I think we'll start seeing um, somebody creating. Um, you know, uh, little daughter boards that go on top of the Raspberry Pi 3 that actually have all of the the audio interface and even the radio on it to make a, a micro node, nice. um, for lack of a better term. Yeah, so so what you're doing is maybe, and, and I don't know, this is a guess, so you've got a Raspberry Pi 3, you're taking one of those USB sound cards maybe? You're, is that kind of what uh-huh. you're using? And plugging that into that's what I'm the, using. the input and output of your rig, I guess? I, that, that's exactly right. I'm, I, I only need uh, discriminator audio, transmit audio, so audio in and out, right. uh, push to talk. I really don't need COR, but I take it anyway, um, meaning that you know that the channel's busy, right? Um, because I'll, I'll actually use the the uh, program itself, the software itself, to do the squelch and detect the CTCSS. So um, so I only need three connections uh, to the radio. Uh, in order to make a uh, an all star node, and um, and and it works on any kind of radio. You can if you've got a if you've got an old Motorola base station, it'll work just as great as uh, as on a new. Um, uh, people are using little uh, Baofeng eight eighty eight uh, portable radios that you can buy for twelve dollars, right. and turning those into um, little portable nodes. I actually thought to do that. I'm actually this is the project on the bench right now is to I'm um, building a, a micro node for. A friend of mine that he can carry around in his car. Nice. I was getting ready to ask you that question. This is totally off the topic here, but uh, are there as many Baofeng radios in Israel as we see in the U.S.? Well, obviously they're they're not because we don't have as many hams. <laughs> yeah. But um, 
uh, I will admit that I carry a little um, Baofeng radio, um, and I do that because I was carrying my three hundred dollar um, Icom uh, portable, and while I was walking the dog, I walked two dogs, and uh, when the dogs got excited, I dropped the portable and um, and and broke it. So at twenty five dollars, I can buy a Baofeng UV five. I can carry it around, and if I drop it while walking the dogs, I can reach in the drawer and pull another one out. And um, I, I don't feel as bad about it as I did when I dropped the ICOM radio on the, on its head. Well, I can understand now, that. <laughs> but frankly, the Baofeng radios are, um, they, they, uh, I have a friend here that says it's an extension of a wireless, it's a wireless microphone for all <laughs> intent purposes. Uh, these radios do not work very well uh, in Jerusalem. Uh you know, if I'm near the bus uh, bus station where there's a lot of antennas and stuff, where there's a lot of RF, um, it gets kind of swamped. When I go up to the repeater site, um, I, I maintain uh, the Jerusalem VHF repeater here. When I go up to that site, the radio can't even hear my repeater that's um, line of sight only about four kilometers away. Wow. So it's not a great radio on the one hand. On the other hand, for what I use it for, and that's to walk the dogs and talk to my own um, all-star repeater. Um, it works just fine. So, um, live and let live there you is go. all I can say. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I've got a box full of them up here. So, uh, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe I can turn them into a, well, a hopefully name. they're all working, right? Well, they're, yeah, they were when I put them in a the box. So, um, <clears throat> uh-huh. they're, they're the three series. I haven't bought a five. Uh, I've used a five numerous times, but, uh, I've got a bunch of threes and I've, I've got a couple of other ones, uh, just to, just well, you to need play. DTMF too. You need DTMF yeah. to control All Star, right? So um, I only buy a, a radio that has DTMF on the front panel. Um, I'm thinking about getting a little DMR portable because you know, as DMR is taking off here, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to be left out. On the other hand, um, we don't have a shortage of channels in Israel uh, to to do All Star. Um, the audio is amazing, uh, so it's it, it's nice and warm. I, I've, a DMR seems a little bit cold to me maybe because of the way the frequency response works and it's a little bit you know it's electronically generated right but um you know we have an opportunity here because we have the channels the channel availability is easy um the coordination is easy um but i i can see in the states that um, um there's places like southern california where you know the chances of getting even a channel for a simplex node might be might be difficult right yeah, well, it's it's definitely something that that is very interesting uh, because it's a new a new toy, a new shiny, uh, and it sounds like to me building one of those nodes will be a great episode of the workbench show. Absolutely, I think that uh, would make a great workbench show. Yeah, George and Jeremy could definitely do that. Yeah, I mean, this is. This is child's play to them at this point. <laughs> Most of this is child's play to them. All right, so uh, we're going to we, we've got something coming up, and it's not too far away. We call it Hamvention. We used to call it Dayton. I guess we have to call it Xenia now. I want to talk about that with Eric here coming up in the last segment of the show. He's going to be there. We're going to be there, and it's going to be a great time. So stick with us. We'll be right back on Ham Radio 360. Texas Digital Radio from mtcradio.com. Their press release just hit yesterday. That's right. The TDR 6100 digital mobile radio for land mobile or amateur radio use is a DMR radio that incorporates the latest technology to provide you with a feature-rich analog and DMR experience. I've got one coming to give it a rundown, a shakedown here in the shack, and I'm excited about it. I think you guys will be too. To learn more about TDR radios, check out mtcradio.com today. As I mentioned at the beginning of the program, I do have a KX2 on the way here. Should be here tomorrow, and I'm really excited about it. I remember seeing this thing back at Hamvention last year, and wow, was I just taken back by it. And and just kind of like, whoa, I need one of those, please. So... Stoked to have Elecraft as a sponsor. Really appreciate them coming on with us. Got a lot of great plans coming up for you. Field day shows, portable operating shows with Kale, learning how to do those sorts of things. And it's all because of Elecraft. You need to know more information. You're interested in Elecraft. Visit Elecraft.com. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. And again, thank you to Eric for being here with us. Uh, his podcast, QSO Today, can be found online at of course, the triple W Q S O today.com. And Eric's been doing it for right at three years and hundred plus 150 plus episodes nearly. 
And uh, that, that's an exciting thing, man. It's a lot of work, but uh, congratulations on the numbers and and really, uh, really looking forward to you continuing to create those great shows that you do. Well, thank you. A lot of fun. A lot of fun. I tell you, the first time I was ever introduced to Dan Romanchik was on your program. That's that's a, he was a guest. Yeah. That's, that's exactly right. That's the first time I'd ever heard Dan, and I was like, hey, I like that guy. <laughs> so, Well, you know, I, I, I like to interview uh, Elmers that also publish. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, they, and now with the, uh, the Internet, uh, Dan is one of those that um, not only publishes, but he uses his blog and the Internet as a way to really extend his, um, his reach yeah. and his influence. Yeah, I, I like to see that. And I'll tell you what, uh, you may not know this, but Dan has one of the nicest handwritings that you've ever seen. The man can write beautifully. I don't, I don't know why. But it's a lost art. It is, and I, I never got it. But boy, when he sent me something in the mail, and it was on the, he wrote on the rear of the QSO card, and I, I had to show it to my wife. I said, "This is a man's handwriting. This is amazing." Dan has a beautiful <laughs> hand. He does. When you guys see Dan at Hamvention, ask him to sign something for you. Uh, buy his book and then have him sign it. You can see what I'm talking about. He's got a great signature and a great handwriting. Speaking of Hamvention, I'm really excited about it. This will be our second trip this year. We confirmed our booths. We're going to be in building number six. And I can't tell you which number uh, because I'm going to say it wrong if I do. But we'll be in building six. Uh, we're excited about that. We're going to be there. Our booth is going to be sponsored by Autodesk, who is a sponsor of the Workbench Show. Totally stoked about being there. Uh, Jeremy and George, of course, will be there. Uh, my buddy Chris, New Ham Radio licensee, uh, KN4BDQ, is driving up from South Carolina with me. So I'm not going to have to fly this time, get to drive. Uh, but you're traveling 7,000 plus miles to see us at Xenia, and I'm really excited about that. What made you want to come well, this year? Oh, I, I think, you know, when you're in the ham radio, um, when you're active in ham radio, as we are, and we're, we're actually speaking to audiences that are saying, um, are you coming to Ham Nation, or not Ham Nation, if you're coming to Hamvention, um, I said, well, I guess at some point I have to come. So yeah. I, I, it's been all this time. I've never been to a Hamvention before. So I'm, I'm very excited about going. But I'm actually I'm, I'm flying to the West Coast first uh, the week before. Uh, and I'm going to do a meetup in uh, in the Bay Area, and I'll send that out. And then I'm moving. I'm going up to see my dad, who's in the Seattle area, and I'll do a meetup up there. And then I'll get to uh, uh, to Dayton probably the Tuesday before Hamvention. So I'll I'll have a lot of time in in Dayton. Very good, very good. Well, it's it's a nice little town. The the little bit that I saw of it last year was great. It, it worked. Uh, this new venue is going to be different, and we were. Quite frankly, a little afraid that uh, we weren't going to get in, and we we were we were very relieved that we we got our spot. So we're excited about that. Uh, we're really looking forward to being there. I think George is uh, putting up some time with a uh, with a forum. It's going to be really cool on Saturday afternoon, and uh, you're going to be there uh, in the building and and walk around shaking hands, kissing babies, and we we hope that you come by and spend some time with us at the booth. Well, I, I'll very much like to do that, but I'll I'll be mostly on foot. I won't have at least at this point. I, I haven't decided to do a um, uh, a booth, uh, most likely because of the uh, the expense involved. But um, I will be out there, and I'll come up with some way of uh, being recognizable as I'm out there on the floor. And then I won't be there on Saturday, but I'll be there on Friday and and Sunday. Cool, cool. And you're also going to do the uh, four days in May. And I'm doing the four days in May, which I'm very excited about as well. And uh, it's funny that it's my understanding that the um, Fairborn Fairborn hotels originally were, um, you know, kind of out on the perimeter. And so four days in May would always do their thing in the in the Fairborn hotels. But apparently the Fairborn hotels are now the closest thing to Zinnia, so they're <laughs> actually really popular now. Yeah, it's <laughs> you've got a have you got a room and a car and all that settled? Um, I'm going to try Uber. Okay. Uh, but I, I have a I have a room, and I'm sh- I'm sharing it uh, with a, another Israeli ham who's coming along with me, and that's uh, uh, Howard Four X One ZZ. You guys have some of the coolest call signs too, by the way. I haven't said that in this whole, but but they're really cool. I like it. <laughs> well, <laughs> I, I'm not sure exactly how they were assigned. I think that um, you know we you know, the the Hebrew language in Israel is is um, read from right to left, so. Um, it occurred to me that the reason I got um, 4Z1UG 
is is because the my the first two letters of my last name are is G U, <laughs> but I guess if you read it from right to left, you know it would be U G. So I, I I'm not sure that's how it came about, but I'm pretty sure that, that there was something involved like that. The, the so, you know, we just learned something big right there. I had no, I was getting ready to ask you how in the world do they assign these call signs? Um, but the two numbers always throws me. But wow, when you hear it on the air, you really know that you found something special. Well, the truth be told, uh, that list is probably on paper and um, at the communications ministry. And I think that um, they just go down the list and say, uh, this looks, this one looks available. <laughs> uh, we don't have a <laughs> – we don't really have – you can pretty much pick it if it's not assigned, I think. Right. And um, if you do that, I was not that uh, assertive right. uh, at the time that my call sign was assigned. But um, But I do know people that – you know, said, I'd really like to have, you know, uh, in Howard's case, he wanted ZZ and, uh, and he got it. Cool. And, and he's coming along. Will this be his, his first time venture as well? I believe so. Yeah. So, uh, so we're kind of excited that, uh, that we'll be there together and, uh, and see what's happening. I'm actually excited, very excited by Xenia. It seems to me that the whole city of, uh, uh, Xenia and it's, um, it's city council and all that stuff is really, um, um, behind this show, and I guess they probably should be. It probably is going to be the largest show uh, that their fairground ever gets. Oh yeah, uh, well, I think they're closing. And if it schools. comes every year, it could be great. Yeah, they're closing schools if I heard it right uh, on Friday. Well, I hope that um, that they'll send those kids to the uh, Hambenchen then. Absolutely, uh, give them a. Maybe there should be some um, some maker spaces there to kind of get their hands into it. Well, I know that Maker Dayton is a really big deal, which is not too far away from Xenia, and uh, I'm hoping that they'll be there this year. So uh, I know that they have a big Maker Fest up in Dayton every year, and um, I, I know that because I see them on Twitter, and they, they're real busy. We don't have a whole lot of that around here, uh, but it's it's cool to see it happen in other places, and maybe as it grows other places, it'll grow around here as well. Um when you're when you're flying into the West Coast, uh, is that is that a shorter flight than if you were to fly to the East Coast, or is it just because you wanted to go home first? Well, actually, I'm 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 going to go and um, I'm stopping in San Francisco to um, uh, visit my friend Wayne uh, N6KR from Elecraft, and um, I'm going to stay with him one night, and then I'm going to fly up to my dad. But uh, the truth be known is is that I'm flying United nonstop from Tel Aviv to San Francisco. And that flight's sixteen hours. Oh my so, uh, but but there's something really cool about it is is, is that I leave just after midnight. Well, I think it's on uh, Tuesday, so I leave just after midnight on Tuesday, and I arrive in San Francisco at six a.m. on Tuesday. <laughs> so, <laughs> figure that one out. Yeah. So yeah. um so I'm crossing ten time zones. Um, I'm traveling about ten thousand miles, and um. And I and I do it in six hours. That's amazing. Uh, but but really on the airplane it's sixteen hours, and uh, I have to get up a lot and walk around just to uh, um, keep from getting what deep leg thrombosis or whatever it is you get from sitting too long in an airplane seat. But it's I'm 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 riding on the new uh, Dreamliner, oh, and cool. uh, and that's an amazing aircraft. And so I always I always uh, look towards these trip with uh, with great anticipation. Will you bring him? Will you be bringing any tech with you? Uh, recorders, uh, rigs, anything like that? Or are you just going to come? Yes, take I'm going to bring. I'm going to bring uh, at least one microphone and the Zoom H5, okay. um, because I hope that um, I'll run into some more Elmers on the floor, um, who will share um, stories with me. Uh, the, the folks at Hamvention have been kind enough to give me a press pass, nice. so I'm I'm coming as media, and um, so that'll allow me to. Um, you know, go out there and um, meet some more hams, and I'm I'm really excited about it. Well, if if I can contribute anything, I think a a bright orange T-shirt with gray and white letters would definitively let people know who you are. Well, I'm actually thinking of a, of having a orange mylar balloon that says QSO today on it, floating above my backpack. Hey, there you so go. So <laughs> that I'll be seeable. So I won't have a booth, but, you know, if you see a guy walking around with an orange Mylar balloon that says QSO Today, look for me. Tap him on the shoulder. And and you're you're welcome to come hang out with us. We'll probably have a few chairs if you need to sit. Although you enjoy walking, I'm sure that uh, the dogs will get tired after a while because it's quite a, quite a lot to see. 
Well, you know what? I've, I've gotten some great um, email advice from listeners, and um, one of them said, um, bring uh, tennis shoes or comfortable shoes because you'll be walking a lot and bring something to eat in case, you know, uh, for me that might be an issue. So I'll bring some, uh, make sure I have something to eat, bring water. And he said, bring toilet paper. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we don't know what to expect with a new venue. We, we don't, he we, said, you know, but if you're a good Boy Scout, you, yeah. you, you, you're, you're prepared. Yeah, we knew what to expect at the, well, I didn't, I man, I'll be very honest with you. I didn't know what to expect at Hera because I had heard some terrible stories, but I'd also heard some, oh, that's just like folklore stuff. And, um, the, the first moments I was there, it was, it was a a reunion of sorts. I'd never met George. I'd never met Jeremy in person. So we had all that surreal happening for a while. And then I kind of settled into where I was and I got to looking around and I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this place is in some terrible shape. And, uh, one trip to the restrooms, you know, it was all it took to, to realize just how far gone that place was. But, you know, uh, I, I did did create some uh, some t-shirts a while back that said real hams went to Hera. Uh, I may wear mine this year. I I don't know because I'm I'm really into wearing my branding, you know, my own stuff. But uh those were fun and that was actually Dan Romantic's idea. I believe it was Dan that that came up with that one. So I'm excited about it. It's going to be a great trip and I'm really excited you're going to be there. I know that uh, your listeners will be really excited as well to get to spend some time with you and to see you. Uh you said you're doing meetups on the uh on the West Coast and uh, all the way up and down, I guess, when you're in California and no, when, so I'm 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 going to do two meetups. Two I'm going to do uh, I'll do a meetup in San Fran in the Bay Area mm-hmm. uh, one night, and then I'll do one almost a week later the the night before I I so it'd be probably the Monday night before the Hamvention in Seattle. Okay, and um, you know, if two people come, that's great. We'll drink a beer together and um and we can talk about ham radio. Mm-hmm. I, I'm excited just to uh you know to run into other hams and um. And talk about our amazing hobby. Well, and and great. for those people that are kind of naysaying, you know, they're saying, "Oh, Xenia, you know, it's not, it's not like the old ham hamvention." You know what? I have to tell you, I think um, I'm following what they're doing. I, I'm following what what Dara is doing in terms of pre- preparing for this hamvention. Um, I think it's going to be a great event, and I think this new place is going to be absolutely spectacular. Um, it, it's it'll be different. You know, it'll be just different, but I think it's going to be spectacular. Well, there was one time that no one wanted to uh, to use FM and our single side band, and then <laughs> there you go, you know, right? And then we didn't like uh, no 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 code hams, and then we didn't like the uh, Chinese handy talkies. I mean, things change, and we just got to keep rolling. Uh, the the main thing to me is you've got a, 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 a what appears to be like you said a city open opening their arms and welcoming you in to making a great event that uh, you and I will both be able to attend with our friends uh, from around the world. And bef- before I let this thought go, I want to say, when you do determine where you're doing your meetups, please let us know, and we'll be more than happy to share them with our audience so that uh, if, if folks are out there on the left coast want to connect with you, uh, we can put them, put them into that place and have them make that uh, connection. Yeah, great. I'll be. I, I'll actually be doing um, put it out on Meetup. dot com as well as on my sites, and I'll send a, I'll send a press release out there you to uh, everybody so that uh, if they want to come, they come. Um, again, I, I think the way to look at uh, Hamvention or any of these, um, and I don't go to all of them, and frankly, I haven't been to a, a ham radio convention for oh, maybe forty years, wow. um, to, to my sorrow. Um, is, is is that it, it isn't really about the place. It's about the people. It is. You know, we're, we're, we're coming to to mix with our tribe. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I think that's what it's all about. So if there's some operational snafus, you know, in their first year in Xenia, you know, we're going to forgive them and, and, and say what a great time we had. Yeah. Yeah. I think you're going to be, if it's been 40 years since you've been one, uh, they've, they're a lot different now, I bet, than they used to be. But I can tell you, at the Hamvention show, the camaraderie there, uh, it, it was just amazing. I mean, it's it's kind of past words. At least it was for me, my first time there, and being a part of it, and and having to be having the opportunity to spend time with my co-host as well as my audience was just. It was almost more than you could take, and and I'm so glad. <laughs> really, I'm, yeah. I'm being sincere. It no, was, no, I get it. It was overwhelming, and um, you know, thinking back on it. Uh, I thought to myself, you know, I'm just, I'm just kale, you know, I'm just this guy that lives in South Carolina, a bunch of kids, you know, stays at home, whatever. Uh, but the program, just like your program, 
it helps this hobby progress. And with certain people, it helps in different ways. And it's exciting to know that we can help pay into those people's lives. And that's that was really cool to see that come to fruition when we were standing there with them on the floor of, of Hamvention last year. Well, you know, Kale, you're, you're no longer just a guy in South Carolina. You're now a tribal leader, <laughs> right? I guess so. Uh, so your, your tribe will gather with you uh, at uh, Hamvention. So everybody has to cut your hair with a number one guard because I don't have any left to cut. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, you'll, you'll wear one of those really cool hats. Yeah, that you, there you uh, go. That you... That's right. That's right. My new camouflage hats. And uh, I know that you and I both will still have our beards, right? So... Um, yeah, I'm afraid it, it, it hides my chin. That's a... <laughs> <laughs> well, Eric, it has been great having you on. Thank you for uh, for scheduling this. Yesterday, when we were recording this, was Eric's wife's birthday. Today, as we're recording this, it's my 18th anniversary with my wife. And uh, not to ever let... Congratulations. Thank you. Never, never to let... Um, ham radio or our hobbies get in the way of family but thank you for your time i know that it's evening there for you and you're probably ready for supper um and uh just just wish you all the best cannot wait to get to see you in less than 60 days i guess by now and it's gonna be it's gonna be a great time thank you so much for your time congratulations with your show and thank you for sharing with us about your show and your life there in israel it's my pleasure kale thanks so much 73 73 Thanks again to Eric for coming on the program. Really excited to have had him here. It was a lot of fun to catch up. He missed supper, I missed lunch, and that's just the split of time between Israel and the great state of South Carolina. Man, it was it was great. We've, we've talked to each other a lot on Twitter. Eric's really busy on Twitter if you guys are interested. He's also on Facebook, Facebook groups, and uh, he's really he really, like me, loves podcasting. So cool to have those conversations with a friend of mine excited to meet him face to face in Hamvention just like last year I got to meet George and Jeremy for the first time stoked to be there again this year with them it's going to be a great time we're in building six we'll put the numbers up when I can remember to post those but it's going to be a blast and if you've never done Hamvention before and you've got some time off work maybe you've got some points on your your airfare thing however that works if you travel for work it's, it's really quite a good investment. If you're loving the hobby, want to learn more about ham radio, that is the place to go, man. It's hard to beat a trip to the Hamvention Show in Ohio. We're going to be doing it. Hope you're going to be doing it as well. We're going to be back next week with the Workbench Show, and George is back in town, which means him and Jeremy will have a really cool show about something that will more than likely be awesome. <laughs> And probably over my head. That's what I was going to say initially. No, they do a great job. It's the Workbench Show opposite weeks of this one, the 360 Show. So if you're looking to learn more about things, you need to make sure you're listening to the Workbench Show every week. Don't miss it. Hey, we we really appreciate you listening. It's a big deal for us for you to share with your friends your favorite podcast. We hope this is one of them. There's a lot of great ones out there and know that your time is very valuable. So if you like it a lot and want to share it with your friends, we're not mad at you. Thank you for subscribing and listening as well. God bless every one of you. I'm going to go, but I'll be back in a week or so. We'll see you next time. All right, y'all, 73. Thank you for listening to the Ham Radio 360 podcast, brought to you by Maine Trading Company, Paris, Texas, and by Elecraft.com, hands-on ham radio. To learn more about the show, visit our website, hamradio360.com. 73s, y'all. <laughs>